Amen. Our God is a God who restores. Our God is a God who heals. I love the, the word that, that came during our second song about one God, one unity, one Savior, one King. And in that, there is unity. In that, there is a oneness. We don't serve many different gods. We serve one God. There is one Lord, one Savior. He is our hope. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He is our King. He is our Lord. He is our hope. He is our Savior. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And no matter where you are or what you do, you call on the name of Jesus and he's there. He's with you. He's not far off. He's not far away. But he's with us. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we lift you high. We give glory to your name. You are above all. You are the ruler, the king, the Lord. And we glorify you today. God, in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, Lord, we recognize, we stop and we recognize who you are. There is no other. No other man compares to you. There is only one King, one Savior, one Lord. That's Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your faithful presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit among us, with us, near us. That as we worship, as we lift you high, you come and your presence fills the place where we are. And we thank you for being faithful to do that today. God, we dedicate the rest of this time to you. We open up our hearts to your word. We open up our hearts to your truth. Because as we recognize that you are the king, we recognize that your ways are higher than our ways. And we thank you for your word. We open up, speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys very much. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you've been having a great weekend. Hope you've been having a great time in the presence of God with us as we worship and as we get into God's presence. You know, it was pretty, I just want to remind us about the word that came from Angie as she was, as we were uh, in the presence of God. She's, the, the, the word of God that came was that the, God is calling the church to be united. God is calling the church to rise up in unity. God is calling the church to recognize the truth that there is one Savior, one Lord, one King, one hope, one spirit. That's our God. That's our God. And in that, there is a unity. As we meet with other Christians who agree the same things, and as, as we worship together, there doesn't have to be any division or competition, but there can be unity. And that's, to, to me, that's what brings us together. We can be from different countries, we can be from different backgrounds, we can be from different uh, families, or we can be involved in different careers or doing different things, but there is a unity in our King. There's a unity in Jesus. And the beautiful thing about the word that came today during worship was that a lot of that is right along with what we're going to be speaking about in the message today. We have been going through a series on 1 Corinthians 13. 
And in 1 Corinthians 13, it's talking about, it's the chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 about love. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8, it talks about love is patient, love is kind. And each week, what we've been doing is we've been looking at what those things mean in terms of God's love for us and how his agape love is patient with us, for example, is kind to us. It is not rude. And it, it, we've been looking at all of those things, all of those points, one by one, week after week. And it talks about how we've, we've been talking about how that's God's love towards us, but it's also about how we can show that same love to other people as well. And last week, we got to the end of the series in 1 Corinthians 13. And what we're starting today is a new series from 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so we've started with the, the, the foundation, or you could say the core, or the central message of love. And now we're looking at what comes before that and what comes after that. And what we're talking about in this series is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. What the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? We're going to look at each one of them and how they work in, in the church, how they work in the life of a believer, what they're intended to do for us. But more than that, not just for us as individuals, but for us as the church as a whole. So what we're going to do today, today we're just going to look through uh, the introduction. And we're going to, I'm going to read some of, uh, some of the verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but I, I want to take a look at the big picture of the whole book of 1 Corinthians. Why did Paul write this to the church? Before we do, I want to read 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 11. This is the, the text for our series. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 11. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you are a God who reveals yourself to us, who speaks to us. You show yourself to us in different ways. And through these gifts of the Holy Spirit, you show your heart towards us. And God, as we look at, the, at your word today, as we talk about these things, God, help us to understand your heart just a little more clearly. What you think, how you operate, so that we can grow in our understanding of you, but we can also grow in how we live and show your life to other people around us. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. We dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to do today is I want to just look at some of the background behind the book of 1 Corinthians. Why did Paul write this book to the church in Corinth? Now, in Acts, in the book of Acts, we see many of the apostles, and we see God working through the apostles. We see miracles and things taking place. But also in the book of Acts, we see the ministry of Paul. You know, he, before that, he was Saul of Tarsus, and God met him on the road to Damascus, and he met with Jesus, and Jesus transformed his life. Just complete transformation. Then he begins telling people and going from place to place, synagogue to, from synagogue to synagogue, telling people about the truth of Jesus in order to get people to believe in Jesus. And so in 1 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, in, in Acts chapter 18, we see that Paul travels to the city of Corinth. 
Corinth is a city in the country of Greece. And we see that Paul traveled to Corinth. And what his habit was, do, was to do is he would go to these places, go to these cities, and he would go to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Jewish synagogue would be like uh, the Jewish church of that day. There was many synagogues inside Israel, but wherever the, Israel, wherever the Jews were scattered, wherever the Jews went, they would establish new synagogues, and they would have synagogues in all of these different cities. And so they would have all of these synagogues in all of these different cities. And so what Paul would do is he would travel from, these, from city to city, and he would stop in the synagogues, and he would open up the scriptures. He would talk to the leaders of the synagogue, and they would look at all of the Old Testament scriptures from, you know, in the book of Genesis and Psalms and, and uh, all through the prophets and that as well. And he would explain to them from his understanding of the Old Testament about how the Old Testament was speaking about the life of Jesus to prove to them that Jesus indeed was the Messiah. And so that's what he would, he would, he would do, and that's what he was in the habit of doing. And eventually, when there were a bunch of believers in those cities, they would begin, they would have a church in those cities. And so that's what he did in Acts chapter 18. He traveled to the city of Corinth, and he started going to the synagogue. And so he went to the synagogue there in Corinth. He was talking to the leaders there. He was talking to the Jews in, 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 in Corinth. And most of the Jews, they rejected Paul. They said, what you're saying is blasphemy. It's not the true word of God. And so they rejected him. But then some of the Greeks who were in that city, some of the, the Gentiles started to believe. And so they believed in Paul. I mean, they believed in Jesus. They uh, accepted Jesus as their Savior. And, as, and they, they began a small church there in Corinth. He also met two important people there. Uh, their names were Aquila and Priscilla. They were husband, husband and wife, and they were tent makers. Now, Paul also had a career outside of uh, preaching the gospel. And what his career was, it was making tents. And so when he met up with Aquila and Priscilla... They automatically had a connection with uh, their career and what they did. But Aquila and Priscilla, they also believed. They were Greek, they were Gentiles, and they believed. And so that began their relationship with Paul. And it says in Acts chapter 18 that Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. And there were several other Greeks who believed in Jesus through the teachings of Paul. One of them was uh, a guy named Justus. And he was, uh, he was a guy who lived right next door to the synagogue. He loved the house of God. He loved the word of God. And he became, um, he became a Christian there in, in Corinth as well. Later on, Aquila and Priscilla traveled to Ephesus. They went from Corinth and they traveled to Ephesus. And they, meet, they, meet, sorry, they met a guy named Apollos in Ephesus as well. Now we'll see... As we look in 1 Corinthians, we'll see Apollos mentioned a little later. So that was kind of what happened in Corinth. So Paul stayed there for a year and a half, uh, talking to the Greeks. Many, many of the Greeks became Christians. And then he stayed there for a year and a half with Aquila and Priscilla and some of the other Christians. And then he traveled and went away. And so a lot of the books of the Bible in the New Testament that Paul wrote were letters from Paul, after he had left those cities, he would write letters back to those churches in those cities. For example, we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. That was Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. We see the book of Ephesians. That was to the church in Ephesus. We see Galatians. We see that was a, a letter to the church in uh, Gal Galatea. Um, and there was lots of different places where Paul wrote letters to. And so these were letters from Paul to, uh, to the church in Corinth there. And so this was, it was probably a number of years later that Paul wrote these letters to Corinth because the church was established more, as we'll see uh, here as we look at the background of 1 Corinthians, we'll see the church was established more. And so it wasn't just a new baby church, but it had uh, uh, a sizable church there in Corinth, many believers and they had regular times when they would come together and study the Word of God together. We'd have meetings together. 
Now, if we look at the book of 1 Corinthians, if we look at it as a whole, we can see some of the main points, the main messages that we see throughout that entire book. And once we see some of the main things, well, we can understand what Paul was trying to say in chapters 12, 13, and 14, where he's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 1, Paul begins talking to the church in Corinth, and in, in verses 10 to 17, Paul said, don't allow any divisions in the church. So right from the beginning, we can see that there were some divisions happening in the church. There was this one group over here, and then there was this other group over here. And this group would talk about this group, and this group would talk about that group. This group would boast and say, I believe because Paul told me this and this and this. And it actually says, it, it mentions the, the, uh, the name Apollos, who we see Paul met later in Ephesians, or sorry, in Ephesus. And so the, the two groups of people were divided because one said, I believe because I believed what Paul taught. The other group said, I believe because I believed what Apollos taught. And there was no unity in the church there in Corinth. They said, I believe because I was baptized by Paul. I believe because I was baptized by Apollos. And Paul stops them and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Paul, who's Paul? Paul's nobody. Paul's not your savior. Paul's not the one who died for you. Who is Apollos? We are just servants of Jesus. We are just followers of Jesus. And this is what Paul was trying to say to the people in Corinth. He's like, let's, let's stop all of, the, all of the divisions. Let's stop all of the fighting and let's be united. Let's be united together. At the end of chapter 1, Paul says, if you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. He says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So he's saying, don't boast about who you believe because you heard their message from Paul or because you heard their message from Apollos. If you're going to boast, boast in Jesus. Give glory to Jesus because he is the only Savior. We don't have two Saviors, one in Paul, one in, you don't have two saviors, there's only one savior, and it's Jesus. So Paul says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says again, he says, when I, when I come to you, I decided that I'm not going to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and his resurrection. He says, I determined, I made up my mind that I'm not going to talk about anything else except one thing. That's our Savior, Jesus. And that he died, he rose again, and he is our one hope together. So he's saying, let's stop all this division. Let's stop all this fighting. Don't boast about this. Don't boast about that. But let's boast and be united together in Jesus. That's why I loved the word that Angie spoke during worship today. Let's all be together. Let's all be united. We have one Savior. We might come from different backgrounds. We might have believed because of this person's story or that person's testimony or this happened or we believe because we attended this event and heard the Word of God. Yeah, okay, we all have different stories. That's God's miraculous work in our hearts and in our lives. But we have one God and one Savior. And in that truth, we can be united. In chapter 3, he continues to, to say there is only one foundation. In verses 11 to 15 of chapter 3, there is only one foundation, and that foundation is Jesus. He is our salvation and our hope. We only have one Savior. Don't boast in men. We are all in Christ. Okay? So this is kind of the situation in Corinth during that time. We see from 1 Corinthians all the way through. And chapter 4, 5, 6 talks about how we need to be united in the church, how uh, we shouldn't be fighting and arguing or bringing court cases against each other, but be united together. 
In chapter 11, there's an, another interesting thing in chapter 11 where Paul starts talking about the conduct and how to live and how to work together in the church services. And part of what he was talking about in chapter 11 is having communion. And so when Jesus, on the night he was led away to be crucified, he met with the disciples and most of you probably would know this story because we talk about it on a regular basis. But Jesus broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup of grape juice, gave it to his disciples, drink from the cup. Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. And so this was a tradition that, they, that Jesus started with his disciples, and it was continued in the early church. And Paul taught them in Corinth to also do this as well. But he says what happened in chapter 11, we can see that Paul was talking about how they were starting to do communion in the church. And what would end up happening is the people would come to church. They would come very, very hungry. And they would have the communion there, and they would have the bread, and they would have the grape juice. And people who would get there would be hungry, and they would take all the bread and some would take it at the beginning, and there wasn't enough for everybody. And Paul said, Paul said, wait a minute, let's stop this. Let's not have divisions. Some come, some come real fast and eat it all, eat all the bread and drink all the grape juice, leaving none for everybody else. Let's not do that. Let's think about each other. Let's be united. This is Jesus' broken body, and you're not sharing it with other people. Jesus shared himself with us but you're not sharing with others you're being selfish and and Paul said let let's stop that let's have unity let's come together as a family and as a family there's the idea of love we're looking out for each other we're not just thinking about ourselves we're not just being selfish we're not saying, I'm better than he is, he is she's better than, he, than she is. No, we're not doing any of that. Think about family. Family loves each other. They care for each other. They provide. They share with each other. Paul says, let's not have any divisions. We have one Savior, one God, and let's look out for each other. So that was kind of the whole lead up into chapter 12. And chapter 12 starts talking about the different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And what he starts talking about is a result of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, And you will receive power when my Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that power is what we see in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we see healings. We see miracles. We see the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We see, we see, we see the word of God brought forth to people in such a way, in such a powerful way, that the people who heard said, what must I do to be saved? Tell me, I, want, I need to be saved. And there's such a power of the Holy Spirit in those words that it brought great change and it brought transformation and so we see the beginnings of the work of the holy spirit the gifts of the holy spirit in the book of acts as a result of god jesus pouring out his power through the holy spirit and those gifts of the holy spirit were active in the church in corinth and this is what paul is talking about but there was divisions, even in the midst of all of the different gifts of the Holy Spirit, there were still divisions. Listen to Paul's language with the idea now that he is addressing divisions in the church. Okay, so think about this. Acts chapter, or sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 and we're going to read all the way through to 11. 
It says, now there are varieties of gifts. There's many different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. So right from the beginning, he's saying, there's lots of different gifts, but there's only one Spirit. There's a variety of service, but there's only one Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is only one God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation for the Spirit for the common good. To one is given the word of wisdom through the, through the Spirit, same Spirit. To another, to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. So each thing he's saying, this is by the same Spirit. This is by the same Spirit. It all comes from one Spirit. So there must be no divisions among you. To another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all of these things, and he distributes to each one individually as he wills. So we see in the list of all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that Paul is saying, yeah, there's lots of different gifts, but there's only one Spirit. So be united. Be united. In verse 7, right in the middle of there, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Or it says, in another version, it says, for the common good. So it's saying that these gifts are not just for one person. It's not just to bless one person. But it's for the good and the benefit of the entire church. Young and old, new members, old members, the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the benefit of the entire church. And later on in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the church as a body. And it says we are all one body. We have different parts in our body. We have hands, we have fingers, we have arms, we have legs, but we're one body. So let's be united. And in your body, if one part benefits, the rest benefit. If my hand is hurt and it gets healed, that's a blessing not just for my hand, but it's a blessing for my entire body because I'm all connected. We're all part of the same body. And that's the same in the church as well. God wants to see his church united. God wants to see unity, not competition, not saying, oh, he's better because he has this gift of the Holy Spirit, or he's better because they do this. And No, we're all together. The gift that one person receives is a benefit to the whole because we're one body. So we see what we're going to be looking at in this series is chapter 12, in chapter 14, but let's not forget chapter 13. You know, when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, when they originally wrote, they, there was no verses and chapters. It was just one big long letter. And so sometimes it can, it can when we look in our Bible and we say, oh, this is chapter 13, we sort of forget, we sort of take it out and just look at the one chapter. But if you look at the whole thing, 12, 13, 14, and the whole book itself, we can see why Paul put this right in the middle. He said in chapter 12, they're talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 14, they're talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But right in the middle is this very, very, very important chapter about love. And it starts, he says, if I have the greatest gifts of all, but I don't have love. I am nothing. I am nothing. And so he's saying this is how important love is. Love is the motivation for these gifts. Love is what brings, brings us together in unity. Love is why God bring, gives these gifts to us so that he can speak to us 
so that we can know his ways, so that we can be strengthened, encouraged, united more and more. So there is that central message of love in the midst of chapters 12 and 14 that talk about all of these gifts. So that's what we're going to be talking about for our series. But before we finish today, I just want to bring out a couple of reasons. Why does God give these gifts to the church? Why does God give these gifts to his people? And I'm just going to read through, through these, but I have verses for each one of them. And if you want to write them down and look, at, look, up, look them up later, we'll see that the reasons that God gives all of these is for the strengthening of his body. Not to lift somebody up. Oh, he hears from God. I don't hear from God. No, not to lift somebody up, but to encourage people to help us all grow together. You know, a gift, a gift should never be about the person who's giving it. It should be about the person who's receiving it. I want to think about when I, when I give a gift to somebody, I want to think about that person. I want to get the best thing for them. It's not about, oh, look at me. I'm a great gift giver. No, I want to be a blessing to that person. And the same is true with God. The gifts don't originate from us. They originate from the Holy Spirit. That's why they're called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They don't come from us. But, for example, if God gives me a word of wisdom for somebody. For somebody. It comes to me, but I'm going to take that gift and I'm going to give it to somebody. I am just the, the, the delivery person. That doesn't make me somebody special. I didn't come up with that idea. It, it's a, the purpose is to bless that person. The, person. the purpose is for that person to know God and know the love of God and receive encouragement from God. And so... When we think about the gifts, it's great that if, if, if we have them and we're using them, but just remember that we're just the delivery person. We're just the delivery person. So, what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for. Okay, and this is taken from 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the common good. Not just for the benefit of one person, but for the benefit of the whole church, every member. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26. Again, it says, it is for the gift is for one member or one part of the body. When one part benefits, the entire body benefits. Chapter 12, verse 25. The gift is not meant to lift a person up or fill a person with pride. It is not meant to create divisions. So once again, Paul is saying, we need to get divisions out of the church. I'm from Paul. I'm from Apollos. It's not about that. I have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They don't have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. No, it's not about that. It's about being united, and it's for the benefit of each person. The gift is meant to benefit the receiver through love. And that's what we see in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, says that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for strengthening, they're for encouragement, and they're for consolation. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 5 and 12, talk about how the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to build up the church. Verse 6 to 19 in chapter 14 says that gifts are meant to bring a clear message. And... Uh, verses 24 to 25 say, says the gifts are to bring unbelievers to conviction and to bring them to account. We live in the season of the Holy Spirit. We live in the time of the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, we have the book of Acts, but the truth is the book of Acts is continuing till today. And the work of the Holy Spirit is still working today. We're still seeing healings and miracles and deliverances words of wisdom, prophecy, all of these things. It's true for us today. And as we learn about 
the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin to exercise and as we begin to practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we're going to see the church grow. We're going to see things change. We're going to see the benefits, not just for one person or the person who receives, but for the whole church. We're going to see strength. We're going to see love. We're going to see more people giving their hearts to the Lord and knowing their Lord on a more personal basis. And I'm really excited about this series. I really believe that we're going to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit grow more and more, not just in the church services, because we can't have big corporate church services right now, but in your own life, when you're talking to people, when you're praying for your family, when you're thinking about things, when you're just on your everyday schedule that you have, God's going to speak to you. God's going to work through you. You're going to have the boldness to speak up and, and say, yeah, I think Holy Spirit's talking to me about this. You'll begin and talk to somebody and it'll bring a, a change in their heart. They'll be a, a, drawn a little bit closer to God through what he does through you. So I'm excited to see what God's going to do through this series. And I hope that you are too. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk through the different gifts of the Holy Spirit in the coming weeks. We, we're going to talk to people who have experience with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, people who have different, who or maybe have um, more of an inclination to different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see how God can work in the church, but also through you as well. So let's pray together as we finish up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have one God, one Savior, one Lord, one Spirit. And God, just like it says in Psalms 133, God, it is a blessing when we dwell together in unity. That unity is oneness at the foot of the cross of Jesus. We all have one Savior, one Jesus, one Lord. And we come to you, God, and we say, bring our hearts together in unity. Bring our hearts together in love. Bring our hearts together as one body under the head of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God, during this series, I pray that you would start to stir by your spirit, stir in the hearts of each member, each person who hears, to grow a little bit, to take a step of faith in the spirit to use those things. When, when the, there's maybe something that comes to mind through the Holy Spirit, speak it out. Speak it out. Pray it. And let's see what happens. Let's see the strengthening. Let's see the unity come to the church. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that this life is an exciting life. The life of the Holy Spirit is an exciting life life of power, a life of miracles, a life of intimacy with Jesus. Thank you so much, God, for your ways. Thank you that you are involved in our lives. We give our hearts to you, God. We say to you, help us to grow in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you guys, if you don't have a small group, get into a small group. If you need to know or need more information about small groups, contact our church. Send us a, a personal message on Facebook or comment, comment on YouTube. If you have any prayer requests, also, same thing. Uh, send us a message. Contact us. We love to hear from you. We love to stay connected. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week, and we'll see you guys all next week.